Hello, and welcome to the second is three part series of building natural connections. I'm Ken Shuttleworth, the founding partner of Make Architects. And in 2013, I established the Future Spacious Foundation as Make's research arm to bring together experts and generate new thinking about how we design the spaces we inhabit. Over the years, we've explored topics including the future of the high street, urban connectivity, and loneliness in the built environment. But I can safely say that this year's program, Building Natural Connections, is our most important work to date. And we're delighted to be collaborating with the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership to deliver it. We wanted to partner with CISL for their world-renowned expertise and experience of bringing together business, government, and finance to create a more sustainable economy. Planning this webinar series with them has helped us better understand the sustainability discourse from both a socioeconomic and a global perspective. And at Make, we're looking forward to incorporating new lessons into our own practice. And while, of course, the timing couldn't be better, the latest IPCC report findings and the COP26 in less than a month's time now. So as for today, we have a superb group of distinguished panelists with us. I'm looking forward to hearing what they have what they'd say and what we can learn to assess, to appreciate, integrate the value of nature into commercial decision-making mm -hmm. and to improve resilience, human well-being, carbon reduction and e economic stability. I think there's something for everybody in there. So please enjoy it. And thanks very much. Over to you, Nina. Thank you so very much, Ken, for your very kind words. We are, of course, absolutely delighted to be working with you on these seminar series. Welcome everybody to the Banking and Bioresilience panel. We all know that we are seeing a rapid biodiversity decline taking place. However, unfortunately, nature is not really incorporated in mainstream economic or financial decisions. There is work underway to try to reverse this, and it will very much be on the subject of today's webinar. We must learn both the built environment sector, the financial sector, and the economy at large must learn to assess, appreciate, and integrate the value of nature into commercial decisions. And today we'll talk about the incentives of how to do this effectively. How can externalities be incorporated into decision-making for all parties across all assets? Of course, we're following on the first webinar, which has spoken all things climate. And we've learned already some things, and we're going to be building on some themes from that webinar. Namely, there was a lot of conversation around the value of collaboration amongst all actors in the value chain. So looking at the corporate actors, looking at the financial actors, and actually bringing those of us who inhabit um, that built environment into the conversation as well. Specifically, it's very important to start those types of conversations, to co-design our spaces and our buildings at the very start, bring together the finance as well as the corporate sectors at the very start of the conversation so that things don't get tagged on at the end when the project is almost coming to its completion. So I think all of us are aware of the need to change. So I think the focus of today's conversation is very much going to be on how do we change? And finance is a great lever for that. So I'm a research director responsible for sustainable finance at CISL. And within the Center for Sustainable Finance, we work with the whole financial system, with investment managers, with asset owners, banks, insurance companies, in looking how can we rewire the financial system to address sustainability more broadly. And we've been looking at this theme of nature and finance and the built environment all in concert. Obviously within CISL, we have a very active program of research uh, and collaboration as well as education and sustainable finance. But we also have a long standing program of education on the built environment. And I would be completely remiss if I didn't mention in this introduction our move to the Intopia building, which will be CISL's new headquarters. It's a retrofitted 1930s telephone exchange, which is currently being transformed into an ultra low carbon sustainability hub. It will set up new standards for 
low energy use, poor carbon emissions, and poor impact on natural resources. But moreover, it will have people at its heart, in addition to climate and nature. It will provide a hub for CISL, for the University of Cambridge, but also for startups and the local environment to come together, to collaborate, to work together in a very sustainable building. So if I can talk you through the format of today's session, we'll start with very brief interview, um, introductions from the panel, which will be followed by a discussion around these themes of finance, of nature, of the built environment, and how do we connect all of them. If I can encourage all of you, this needs to be not only discussion among this absolutely wonderful panel that we've got, but a wider discussion. So if I can encourage all of you to submit your questions into the Q&A box, that'd be absolutely fantastic. Now, if um, before I introduce the panelists, could I ask all of you to help us create this joint conversation to tell us a little bit of who we're talking to, who is in the room. So if I could ask for the poll to be opened, um, the Zoom poll, if that could be running, fantastic. Thank you so very much. In the meantime, as this poll is running, let me introduce the absolutely brilliant panel that we have in the room today. I have to say, I will do very short introductions. These are all very distinguished speakers, but I will only mention briefly kind of their main roles. So we'll have Ihab Saib today, founder and director of innovation at Biome, Emily Hamilton, head of ECG, ESG at Savills Investment Management, as well as a trustee for National Park City Foundation, Ursula Hartenberger, director and founder of Path to 2050, and Pierre Russo, senior strategic advisor to BNP Paribas. How are we doing with our poll? In the meantime, do you have do we have some results before we start our conversation? Absolutely brilliant. So we have an overwhelmingly business audience with a sprinkling of government, finance, civil society, and academia. Fantastic. I'm look, really looking forward to engaging with all of you today. So if I start our conversation with a question to Ihab. Ihab, can you please kick us off by talking through a real world example of how can nature be incorporated into the day-to-day -day business and financing decisions? Absolutely, thank you, Nina. Um, hi everyone, so I'm Ihab Syed. Um, I founded Biome about five years ago now. Um, we're a research and development led by a manufacturing company and we place biomimicry at the core of everything we do. We allow nature to lead innovation and we've developed some groundbreaking bio-based materials, including mycelium or mushroom-based insulation for buildings, uh, organic refuse biocompound or org, which is a material made of food and agricultural uh, excess resources and byproducts. And they all have limitless applications across industries. And we're working also towards a plant-based concrete and uh, a nature-inspired construction system in the future. Um, but we work also very closely with major key players within the industry. We offer them resource or waste management services or consultancy, and that way we're able to embed biomimicry in major processes that are already existing within current systems. So always working within the current systems, but disrupting in an empathetic and compassionate way. And what I think is really interesting um, that we're talking about how to preserve and regenerate nature, uh, the ironic thread I'd like to introduce into the conversation is that perhaps the answer may lie within nature and that by understanding natural and biological systems and processes on various levels and through many lenses, we can begin to extract principles and codes and algorithms that have really been refined over billions of years and apply them to our economic and financial systems. Fantastic, that's a brilliant intersection. Thank you. If I can follow up with a question to Emily, how does this perspective fit with both your work on National Park City and your job leading sustainability um, efforts in investment manager? Thank you, Nina. It's a pleasure to be here today. More and more, they are aligning, which is fantastic. Um, after many years of it seeming to be quite far apart in terms of how people perceive nature and then business, 
In terms of the work we're doing, National Park City Foundation, our aim is to make 25 cities by 2025 become national park cities. And by that, we mean greener, healthier and wilder. And to help get different cities on that journey, a new handbook has been provided called the Journey Book, which provides guidance for cities that are looking to become a national park city like London has done. And in the last few weeks, we've had conversations with Glasgow, with Adelaide, with, I was on a call with Galway the other week, and they're all wanting to look at how can they embed that into their processes. One of the big areas people are struggling with is the finan financing. And that's where investment comes in. And in my role in terms of head of ESG at Savills IM, we're looking at what we can do to overhaul the investment process so that nature ESG is all seen to be fundamental upfront rather than further down the chain. So when you're buying a building, what are you doing to make sure that you're building on land that is you know, not going to be flooded, that you're thinking about how to connect these spaces with the local community, that you're using the people side as much as the environment side to kind of drive best practice in health and well-being, which is equally a very important aspect in nature. So having access to green space, having green roofs and giving people that way to connect with nature as much as you see kind of in places like forests as well as so bringing it into buildings. Thank you, Emily. And if I'm following that up with a question to Ursula, within the business and financial world, nature is currently seen, unfortunately, as an externality. And I have to say, I hate this word externality because it, it, it makes it sound as if it's something that's really not relevant to us, as opposed to something that we've actually purposefully not included in the way we think about this world. So how can we change that? Ursula, you're still mute. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Nina. Um, I think at least, you know, I take these encouraging signs from, from, from Emily that things are changing, but at least, you know, up to very recently, um, I mean, nature and the services it provides, um, they have largely been ignored by business and finance, essentially, because I think that we all think they come for free. You know, they're just out there. They're just, take, they're just being taken for granted. Um, and, uh, they, you know, I think the perception is that they don't really carry any monetizable value. Yeah? And, uh, and if, even if they did, it's, it's very complex, as he have said, you know, we, we're talking about very complex processes. And if people don't understand, and how do you measure that? And how do you actually reflect that on the balance sheet or convince your client of investing in nature-based solutions, um, like the ones that he have mentioned? or green spaces. But I think there are now, like uh, Emily said, there are promising signs that this may be changing because after all, I think if there's one thing that the pandemic has actually you know, taught us is that we appreciate nature and we value it. I mean, you just look at the rush to buy country properties everywhere around the world. Um, and uh, and the, the joy that people took in their time, even the tiniest gardens and access to green spaces. Um, so the problem, I think, is that the relationship between uh, nature and green infrastructure and nature-based solutions is, and the monetary value that they, they, they should carry is not really well understood. Um, and we really don't know how to measure that and uh, that we don't know, we no longer treat it as an externality. I hate the word as well, but that is integral part of decision making. But I think... Um, I think that may be changing now, and I think that the new taxonomy, um, the EU taxonomy, uh, may well uh, provide for an avenue to change that, um, because it defines not only technical screening type criteria for climate change adaptation and, uh, and mitigation, but also for now there's a draft set of um, of uh, criteria um, up for you know was up for consultation until very recently on biodiversity as well. So it's not my place here to bear any judgment on the merit of these draft criteria, uh, but I, the very fact that they're out there, I think, is sends the right signals to investors and developers about the potential financial value of nature. Thank you, Ursula. And that gives me a really brilliant connection to bring Pierre into the conversation. So last, but definitely absolutely not least, Pierre, can you please shed some light on how do we connect the financial system and banking with uh, to nature? Yeah, the first of, the first of all is to recognize that uh, 
we have to stop to consider nature at zero. And this is what we have done for the past uh, 50 years. So as soon as uh, we, we state this, it, it creates a value. So it means that we can start to, uh, we can start to uh, think about it as a financial solution. And I use the word solution, not product. And this is bring me to, it's not a banker alone that will become uh, on one day a biologist or will understand the value. So we will have to work in collaboration with nonprofit organization, with uh, scientists, with the people who do understand and the client who do uh, the corporate client, but also the investor who will understand the value of this nature. And as soon as we have value the nature, we have also to consider this on a different time. On the past 20 years, all finance spend the time to manage and to stabilize the short term. And now we have to consider if we want to take into the nature, the nature is not a short term value, it's a long term value. And so we need to reconsider and we need to put back in finance the concept also, of course, we need to keep a, a stability on the short term, but it's also very important that we align this with a vision on the long term. And if we do consider the two, we will have a different perception of the value that we will give to the nature. Integrating nature into business is not only avoiding emission for carbon or avoiding destroying biodiversity, but it's also to create business where you regenerate biodiversity and nature and it's possible and where you capture carbon. And if you create new business model, when you do integrate those two components, you will generate definitely a business which is much more profitable than the one that normally you had without considering being into account. Thank you so much, Pierre. So it sounds to me like um, Ursula, Pierre, and certainly myself are highly reluctant, um, to, or rather think that the value of nature currently is at zero and we definitely need to increase that uh, value. However, the whole idea of valuing nature is controversial in some way, shapes or form. And I was just wondering whether, Ihab, whether you could come in on that question, as well as maybe reflect, give, give a counteraction to what Pierre was saying, but how do we get that corporate and finance thinking tied in together a wee bit better? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an important question um, because I think when you say nature, um, it seems like it's such a large thing. It could mean so many different things. So what exactly are we valuing? Um, and I think when you also look at it from a perspective of valuing something, uh, with in relation to its impact and that's its socioeconomic and environmental impact as well um, then you start to look at things slightly differently so it's more about you being driven with the aim of regeneration um, and you're looking at how you can optimize that regeneration along the way um, as opposed to uh, valuing something as it stands today um, because I think that's where we need to be talking at the moment when it comes to the systems we're creating we need to aim for regeneration because sustainability is just not enough. Um, and so as you're trying to work towards a regenerative kind of system or approach, you're mimicking uh, the processes that exist in nature that value something based on the impact it has on its ecosystem. Um, so I think that's just an interesting way to look at it instead of valuing nature as a kind of abstract concept um, to look at valuing the impact that something uh, has, whether it be natural, man-made or uh, yeah, synthetic. I mean, that's fascinating. I guess when uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work on nature within CISL, within the Center of Sustainable Finance, and we look at both the impact on nature, but also the risk of our dependency on nature. So, you know, we have seen that quite famous report that 50% of our GDP is fundamentally highly dependent on nature. And yet we're not really bringing it into our financial risk frameworks. So if I go maybe now to Emily, Emily, could you kind of, you're combining those two hats rather admirably. And there were a couple of things that came both from Pierre and from Ehab in terms of the long and the short term um, view on, on finance and on nature, as well as on this risk and opportunity, uh, risk and impact lens. Could you maybe comment here? I think it's incredibly difficult within the current financial system for businesses, for fund managers, for investors 
to be valuing nature in a financial sense because sustainability by its very nature is over the long term which you've already heard what we can do is say is that the right way to be valuing something and actually do you move away from purely financials so and look at more of a triple bottom line you know shared value approach but even with that when you've got a three-year fund for example how are you expected to demonstrate that that fund can re make returns on things like if you put a green roof in well at the moment valuation of buildings means you can't in an easy way you can't say that if you do x this will create x value although there's lots of intangibles that say having more green space having um more water efficient technologies does increase your premiums so what you could look at instead and what we're starting to look at is well okay for the lifetime that we've got that building in our care what can we do to then make sure as a stewardship approach we're passing it on to the next and by almost breaking it down and saying look a building is 60 years when you're trying to integrate nature into the built environment and the surrounding areas it's typically a 60 year life cycle but there's gonna be different owners during that 60 years it's generally you don't have that many instances where you have one person owning a building except really in residential but even then that might chance go to other owners during that time so what can you do to break it down and almost create this collaborative approach where we do our bit you do your bit and you pass it on and that way the investment up front will show that longer term you get what you need in terms of the investment returns if you put a green roof in it may not come back in three years but it will come back in five years and that uplift of what you've done in the three years will actually show partially when you sell it on and then the next person will get the next benefit and and so on and so on so i think it's about how we break it down the other way is looking at tcf D, they've now come up with a TNFD, which is a task force for nature financial disclosures and how businesses are starting to be able to be articulate around nature. And I think it's really, really clear that we've got a massive skills gap. We've got a massive skills gap on carbon. We've got an even greater skills gap on nature. And the next stage is to get people literate with the language about nature, about breaking it down and what does it mean? And I think if people and businesses put more training in, that really helps. And one of the things National Park City has been doing is training up rangers, so local people, to join, to join their communities and become a ranger for their area, which could mean things like nature walks. It could mean things like writing poetry, going to plant trees. Um, we've got one ranger that loves doing so like walks about learning about fungi um with other people in their community and i think we need to get this language used every day as much as we're using about carbon and that will help us start to fill this gap thanks emily and just re i'm remembering that we've got a mostly business um audience in the room a short uh, kind of a, a maybe explain our task force for climate related financial disclosures has quite famously said that we're supposed to disclose our climate related financial risk in mainstream um, annual filings and the task force for nature related financial disclosures which has just been set up this summer and will run for the next two years is actually looking at the double materiality approach which is quite interesting because not only will it look to get financial institutions and corporates disclosing their risks, their dependencies on nature, but also their impacts. And that's a very different process and it's a very quite, quite difficult. Now, we started sort of talking about this voluntary maybe industry initiatives like TCFD, like TNFD. But if I go back to Ursula, Ursula, you were talking about the taxonomy. So how does the whole kind of policy and regulation sphere, be it practices, standards, the taxonomy, how is that helping us drive that integration forward? Well, I think uh, to start with, um, it's it's about creating a common language. I think that, you know, something that, that Emily Rousseau referred to. Um, and, uh, and I think Ehab as well, he said, well, you know, what do we mean by nature? Yeah. Um, and I think uh, you were quite rightly saying that a lot of the focus has always been about carbon. So it's a very carbon, carbon centric uh, view at the moment. But as I said, increasingly that I think is beginning to shift. Um, and uh, 
and in some ways by creating that common language by having a set a fret you know a set framework of of criteria against which you would screen your investments and in you know in a, in, in 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 the sense of uh construction of your your projects um you you would then at least have um you know, I'm not saying it's perfect, but you would actually have a frame that would provide you with some indicators as to what would be acceptable and what would not be acceptable to rate in order to raise green finance. Um, and I was quite surprised that um, that the sustainable finance platform came out with these criteria for biodiversity um, before actually coming, you know, for buildings, um, because it is quite complex. Um, but it also, I think the current draft, um, I said I wasn't going to comment, but now I am commenting, is I think it leaves, but there is still room for improvement because it shows really the need for capacity building, which has already been mentioned, um, and more literacy around what does it actually mean to have green infrastructure. You know, I mean, people are very familiar with green roofs now, but the you know the possibilities um, are, are myriad and manifold, and that there is still quite a the lack of understanding. I think which needs to be filled, and that's on the part of the built environment community, but also uh, you know there's a the lack of literacy also on the part of the financial community. Yeah, who always struggle with technical things, and this is definitely even bigger than carbon for them. Yeah. And can I just stay with you, Ursula, for a second? Could you give us, to, to make it a little bit more real, could you give us an example of how that would work? What would work? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> for example, let, okay, let's go into, so effectively when we're talking about um, new biodiversity standards within the yeah. European kind of, yeah. how do you see, maybe talk us through a teeny tiny example of how you see this coming into practice. Well, in, in essentially, I mean, to date, we've got two taxon, full taxon, fully ta taxonomy, one for climate change uh, mitigation, one for adaptation. So the proposal is now on the table for a fully fledged um, uh, taxonomy for, uh, for biodiversity, uh, for buildings, for, for new construction, for, for renovation, and also for acquisition and ownership. Um, and as I said, there's still, there is still work that needs to be done on this. So as an investor, so if you have, you could actually choose to um, raise finance, green finance against biodiversity and not against climate change. So there will be, so you can pick and choose what you would like to, what you would like to report against. Um, within, within the biodiversity criteria, there will always be the do so-called do no significant harm criteria to make sure that by actually working on biodiversity, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not actually uh, causing any negative harm to, 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 to climate change or to, uh, to, to circular economy or to the adaptation. But I think what this also provides investors with is actually quite a holistic view so you're not just zooming in on one thing, but you also have, you, you, you're beginning to understand the linkages between these issues. Um, and, you know, it's an educational exercise, I think, for, for, for financial institutions and investors to understand that adaptation is automatically linked to uh, maintaining and safeguarding biodiversity as is climate change and circular economy, you know, all those products or, you know, we're not supposed to call them products <laughs> according, according to, yeah, but you know, the, these new solutions that EAP is developing. So, and I think, you know, every system has imperfections, but I think that this is, this is a very, very good starting point and could be quite a game changer, especially for, you know, subjects, um, topics that, to date have been more on the fringe. Perfect, and actually now is a great time to bring Pierre back into the conversation because Pierre has been at the forefront of financing green sustainable solutions for many, many years. Pierre, how do we do you see this taking place in real life financing situations? Uh, yes, uh, I think I would like to come back to the TNFD and say that first of all, is what is important and just for the sake is that uh, for, for once, this finance would take the lead. So if we restart at the TNFD, it's where, it's where uh, people, uh, we were the co-share of it at the beginning, and we worked directly with a non-profit organization to launch it. So it realized that uh, 
that uh, we, we take the lesson of uh, the past with the carbon and uh, we, we are jumping probably faster. But this is not because we do that, that we are doing the sustainability. Sustainability, and this is why I don't like sustainable finance, because normally we should say finance for sustainability, because the sustainability will be done by the corporates, will be done by the people, and finance can accelerate and as a means in order to accelerate. So the role that we can play on that is really to demonstrate that based on norms, based on risk management, but also opportunities. So it's a balance between we have risk on one side, we need to analyze the risk, and this is what the TNFD will do. But the, on the other side, we have also to, to follow and to support the corporate who will go to transition. And transition for me is the key word. We have to finance the transition. We have never been used in finance to, trans, to finance the transition because we, we were in a linear economy. So when you are in a linear economy, you don't have to transit from anything. Transiting means you have to withdraw, we have to disinvest, and you have to reinvest somewhere. And so this is, this is where we need to help the people. Nature, as one thing, contrary to carbon, we can see the transition. On carbon, you don't see the transition. You say you have to transit from there to there, but you don't see the effect. The effect will be in 40 years. But when you, when you do it on nature, you can do it immediately. And if you do it in the ocean, it's even faster because the way to rehabilitate and to regenerate nature into the ocean is, is, is faster than on Earth. So because we can see it, you know, it's simple. The people do what they see. <laughs> um, I'll give you an example. If you create a marine protected area, uh, first the, the, the fishermen will complain, but they will realize that after three years, they will have more fish to fish around it than they ever been before. Why? Because by your recreating and regenerating nature, you recreate an additionality, you recreate additional resources. And if you manage resources, if you do not destroy them stupidly, then you, you realize that you can, you can use those resources and in a, in a larger scale. So this is also, I give you another example uh, on nature. We are about to think about uh, rehabilitating a lake which has been completely destroyed without any fish now. Even if we finance the rehabilitation, the first effect will be to bring back the seagrass and the seagrass will capture carbon. So even if we are not developing a new economical value on the back of that, and we will because we will redevelop the fishermen and the fisheries, but at the beginning, we can already value the fact that by rehabilitating seagrass, we are creating 15 million tons of carbon that will be captured. And this has a value, a value, a human value, but also an economical value. So it, it demonstrates that even without going to there, we can start to rethink about different solution, different solution. And for that, we need to bring the people who will believe in that project of rehabilitating is because we have, we have on the back of that 10 scientific people who have built up the model. It's because you have, a, you have a, a, a political people who believe on the project. It's because you have finance people who are ready to finance the project. So you have to bring all this together to make it happen. Because if one piece is missing, the scientist one, or, um, uh, or, the, uh, or the, uh, the political one, it will not work alone as a standalone. It's not a bank, it's not an in a financial institution that will solve the problem. And last but not least, we need to finance the transition. So that means we need concessional money. We need to create the ability to work with concessional money and concessional money can come from public, from public or philanthropy. And we need to, to start to put in place what we call this concessional loan. So that means the money which is landed to a project and we will pay back when the project start to have an economical value. And so if we start to do this, and we start to recreate those solutions, then we will engage in new type of investment. Yeah, and just to clarify again, so the concessional money allows you to bridge that long, short, long-term, exactly. short-term problem, as well as potentially the problem of investing into more emerging markets where the credit rating conditions may not be quite as conducive and allow the private finance to flow in. Yes, exactly. So 
it 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 can play a different role. It can it can also be uh, in a non uh, emerging market a, a greenfield project that nobody wants to go because the criteria that has been put in front of the investor, you know, investor uh, or banks they have to follow regulation. So today they are not allowed to invest in a certain number of uh, of, of of solution of or an, or a project. So here the concessional money will allow to do this transition. And, and, and uh, I think it's very important that we link, that we link this uh, different type of financing together, the public, the private, the philanthropic one, that in different role and in different function. It's Thank called you. blended I, finance. Yeah. yeah. And so let me bring Ehab here because um, we, we have quite a, a solutions oriented perspective from, um, from Pierre. How, Ihab, how have you seen this kind of coming from a more innovator corporate angle? How is that financing collaboration have been working out? Yeah, thank you, Nina. Um, I think, Pierre, I, I can't agree more about how um, there is an economic system intrinsic in every resource and, and everything, and it's all about how we value them. And I think that's really related to answering your question, Nina, because um, finding investors that are aligned when you're working on something that is perceived to be a fringe or that is not necessarily the conventional way of doing things, um, you need to have an extreme alignment with your investors and finding the right um, doors to open and the right kind of uh, financial uh, methods and, and approaches that you're, are going to work for you. Um, so I think one barrier from an innovative perspective is not the fact that there is no uh, finance. In fact, there's an abundance of finance everywhere. It's just knowing where to find it and how to access it. Um, and it's knowing how to access it or the bridge between the need and uh, the availability of finance um, is one that has been, um, you know, not really, has been the main barrier for, for startups and SMEs. Um, and I think once uh, you find the right investors, there may not be the right alignment that you need. When you're thinking of what Emily mentioned earlier, longer fund life cycles, um, and talking about how we can look at, uh, you know, the fund life cycle being about 10, 20 years, and we've encouraged some investors to actually change their fund life cycles over to 20 years or longer in the future, because it's just, it makes much more sense when you're tackling such a big challenge and such a big systemic um, uh, problem that is, you know, uh, uh, around in every industry and in every sector. And so when you're changing perceptions, when you're changing mindsets, when you're having real transformation and, you know, introducing new concepts like valuing nature into finance and accounting, um, you need the financier or the financing body uh, to be just as aligned as you are in, in going on that journey. And that's, I think, what's quite rare and what makes it a little bit difficult because it needs a complete mindset shift um, to, to start thinking of things in this way, to think of uh, carbon as a currency. It's just a measurement that we use to measure the impact on the environment. And using all these currencies, that whether it be carbon or uh, impact on biodiversity and so on, um, enables us to then uh, convert currencies like we convert currencies currently, but use currencies that are embedded in nature, uh, just like we link currencies to uh, the values of other, other things around us. So I think there's ways of doing this, but you just need the open mindedness and you need the alignment uh, with the finance sector that you're dealing with directly. That's really interesting. And I think we have the banking perspective and we have um, the investment management perspective, but I just wanted to follow up with the insurance perspective as well. Because uh, I think insurance has this absolutely wonderful ability to actually insure something that they don't own, which is conducive when we talk about nature. So um, I, I was gonna throw it back to Ehab for a second to see whether you have a view of how, how does insurance fit into this conversation? Absolutely. Um, that's actually one of the biggest barriers when it comes to the construction industry anyway, maybe also automotive industries where the risk is quite uh, tremendous. And I think um, from our perspective, it's about taking insurers on a journey. It's understanding how current systems work, what the requirements are, and when you're introducing a new radical disruptive solution, um, that it's actually aligned with current standards, current processes. Um, and it's this way of working within current standards that enabled us to advance much quicker than we usually would have, um, as opposed to trying to create our own standards and start new, completely new ways of doing things. 
Um, but we have identified real barriers in the accreditation standard systems that um, don't really enable uh, innovators to come in with new unusual uh, materials or products, for example. Um, and that's because these standards are um, usually funded by industry and supporting their own products. And these products currently conflict with new natural based solutions. So I think when you trace back the financing and when you look at how the systems are actually working, you realize that a complete mindset change is required in order to, to get over that um, hurdle and start valuing nature properly. But insurers will come on board with you if you start the conversation early, because they are definitely a, a major door that can open um, the market to, you, to your products and your solutions. Thanks, Ihab. And following up on what Pierre was talking about in terms of the importance of coalitions, if I bring Emily back into the conversation about how do you, you know, how do you go about creating coalitions for success and what do they look and who are the actors there? Well, through National Park City, our whole aim is to create coalitions. Um, we're a very small charity, so we need to be able to reach out to all the different actors in the community, in business, um, in government in order to drive forward our agenda and to get people on side. So one of the ways we're doing that with the built environment is through a development forum. It's reasonably new, only set up this year, but it took about 18 months to get all the different developers on side and in agreement that they would join this forum, which is absolutely free, doesn't cost anything to join, but to get the trust in terms of sharing what they are doing and creating a common language and a common framework, we've basically asked them to all sign up to a set of terms of how they will practice their projects. Many of them are already practicing their projects in this way, but helping to show that what they are doing isn't just, um, for example, putting in a green roof that doesn't have much biodiversity value, but thinking about the wider site and what they're doing to connect their site with a neighboring um, park. And then eventually what we'd like to see happen, we've got 12 developers in the forum and they're all London based. And therefore we now have North, South, East and West of London covered. And the idea is then to start to share knowledge between what's happening in the South of London, what's happening in the North, how could we start to create these corridors between the different development sites? And so they've all given through a demonstrator project. Um, for example, we've got Roots in the Sky, which is a project by Fabrics, and they are seeking to build Europe's largest rooftop garden by repurposing a building in Southwark that used to be um, a court, which has now been turned into offices and a cafe. And they've taken what would be the most expensive part of the building, which is the rooftop, if it was to be residential, and made it a community amenity. Um, by having a cafe with a big rooftop garden. So what we're trying to do is share that knowledge of what fabrics are doing with other developers. And then like the same, for example, Quintain in Wembley Park, what they've done with the, um, all the tree planting and how that can then help. So these coalitions, I think are absolutely vital, but it only works when we start to take a place-based approach all the time we're saying, will you do your thing up here? We'll do ours down here. We won't actually get very far if you start to look at how you're connecting these developments into existing places, into new developments by another developer, then I think we'll start to see green corridors and, and all the things that we know we need. And actually those things don't necessarily cost a huge amount of finance. It is just about getting that collaboration to work and the different actors. Um, which I think is something we need to think about more about solutions that aren't as expensive, but just require more time, which in that way can make it more expensive. Thanks, Emily. And I see that we're starting to get questions. Can I encourage everybody um, to submit questions? Because I can see that a couple have popped up and Pierre is very busy answering them on text. But while I do that, um, I just wanted to follow up very quickly with Ursula, because Ehab was talking about the issues with uh, kind of with standards and lack of standards that actually enable that innovation to take place. Ursula, could you come in and, and give us a, a view on that? Well, I think uh, what Ihab was, uh, was referring to was sort of like standards uh, for products. And of course, you know, they are mostly written by the industry that produces it was absolutely right. Um, but I think we need to distinguish here between kind of like industry standards or standards how you would actually value this 
Um, and in terms of actually valuing uh, nature, um, you know, again, that insurance, um, uh, nature-based solution, that insurance um, aspect comes into play there as well, because, uh, you know, we saw even 10 years ago, uh, uh, when, you know, studies that have been carried out around like pre value premiums for energy efficiency technologies, for instance, uh, most of them were pointing to uh, positive premiums, but there were also in some parts of the world, I think it was Japan, actually, where these were seen as an insurance risk or they were seen as a maintenance risk or an operational risk or health risks. Um, and therefore, you know, there, there was no premium. It was actually a negative, uh, negative premium. So, and I think this is, uh, there's something that there's some work that needs to be done uh, to work with insurers, but also, you know, inextricably uh, connected with that, also with valuers uh, and with banks, how they, how they get instructed. In terms of valuation, it's actually, it's actually not rocket science, yeah? Because uh, it doesn't matter, it's just another sustainability parameter. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just a parameter that you need to take into account. But if your client has doubts about it, or doesn't have it on the radar, you will not take that into account. And it brings me to another, you know, another issue um, that is actually a barrier is if you haven't got you know empirical data to back up um the premium or the discount uh, the, the you know the, the the brown discount for not actually having this um then you're lost right from the start i mean in terms of valuation it's impossible if you haven't got data um and we've seen how long it's actually taken to wake up the world to the need of capturing um you know carbon data carbon related data i think we haven't got the time left um, to start waiting that we develop some data sets for, uh, for, for natural solutions or for, for nature or nature, you know, the, the services that nature provides. So there I see a really, really big challenge. So my, my, my call would be really to start, to start working on that data now, because it, as soon as, you know, policy tools get traction or there is, uh, you know, that it's just another disaster has to happen and everybody says, oh, we have to do something. But if you're not ready, if you haven't got capacity in place and if you haven't got any data sets that you can work from um, that uh, that are seen, that are seen as reliable and robust, uh, if, you know, you have, you have, uh, you have a time gap uh, where you lose in, you know, very valuable time. Um, so that would be my, that would be uh, one of my key messages, actually, you know. And maybe one comment from me on this. I think we've been working on creating a handbook for nature-related financial risks and how do you assess those? And um, over the summer and kind of coming into autumn, we've been working with financial institutions to actually create use cases, which demonstrate the financial materiality of these risks uh, for our financial institutions' portfolios. And so one thing that actually became apparent is that there are data sets that you can use to look through individual risks. And there are models out there. So on the one hand, yes, we don't have this kind of massive available data sets. But on the other hand, we do have data that we can use today. We have models that we can use today. And we can already create this scenario analysis and look and take us through those at risks. I wanted to go to questions because effectively we've had already two very interesting questions, both on the finance angle. And I see that Pierre has answered some of them um, on the chat and Emily is typing, but I wanted to give both of them a chance to maybe comment on it, to, um, to talk through two things. Number one, whether fiduciary duty is blocking the stuff, which I, I don't fundamentally believe. I think it isn't fiduciary duty obligations to actually entail sustainability into the conversation, but maybe comments from both Pierre and Emily on that. And number two, the problem of um, divestment versus engagement with relation to nature. So if I go briefly to Pierre to give a little bit of voice to his comments and then to Emily, that would be absolutely fantastic. Here, you're mute. On the fiduciary duty, uh, I, I tend to agree. Uh, today, today the people tend to, to, to use it too much as an excuse uh, and not necessarily as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as it is. And um, we do see that uh, people anyway will either naturally or uh, 
they will do it institutionally by changing and by adapting the, the fiduciary duty uh, rules. Uh, I think it makes sense today because when we look at, there is another things which is not set up in fiduciary duty in many cases is timing, like I mentioned before. And the people don't tell you, don't tell you at what time you have to make uh, the, the best uh, return, uh, risk return for your client. So it, it, if you incorporate the, the time factor, it may change completely the vision that we have. Uh, th there is one thing I want to, 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 to mention, which is a, a very good concept which has been uh, put in place is the natural-based solution. Because the natural-based solution, uh, which, is, uh, which has a clear definition through the IUCN, for instance, today, uh, integrate the climate change, biodiversity, and, and the social aspect of a business. So today, every single project can be reviewed as a and evaluated as a natural-based solution. Maybe they don't tick all the box, but at least they can be evaluated against that principle. And that's a very practical way today to see if the business that you need to invest in today in order to, uh, and you need to finance um, uh, and, and with the delivery in the future uh, is aligned with what has to be done in order to take into account those three criteria about climate change, biodiversity, and the social aspect of it. Because the three are linked. And so if we start by that, it means that, and with the pressure that the people have on the commitment of 2050 uh, net zero carbon, um, which, which will impact biodiversity through the natural-based solution, uh, we will see that there will be a lot of projects that will come on the table that we will have to finance through the transition. And I come back to the fact that uh, we need to look at those new opportunities and. Uh, the, the role of the money, the concessional money, uh, in order to make bankable those projects, because some of them maybe immediately can be seen as non-bankable. And I give an example of the, one of the projects we're working on, which is not a dream, which is a reality, is the Coral Reef, Resilient Coral Reef Project. And the Resilient Coral Reef Project, we have an incubator when we collect all projects which are necess not necessarily bankable at the beginning, but in order to go to the investment window, we make them bankable through concessional money grants and, and different other mechanisms. And we help the people by providing technical assistance uh, when it's needed. And suddenly, we do realize that those projects are viable. Another way to make them viable also, because we're talking about investors being interested in nature, is to combine projects by landscape concept. So that means uh, mixing energy with uh, resource production, with processing, with decarbonization on, the, on a given place can provide a return, which is very stable. For instance, if you take one of them only, or if you take one activities only, it will probably not be seen as uh, profitable. But if you see the collection, and today we do see that producing energy through biomass or through solar or through renewable, is very complementary on an agriculture activity or an aquaculture activity. Uh, we can be also building to a processing close by proximity processing. And then you create, you create a landscape and uh, uh, you create an ecosystem which could be, could be financed in once. And then you finance a landscape or you finance an ecosystem. And there you can finance projects that normally were not financed before. Thank you, Pierre. And if I go now to Emily with her views on both the fiduciary duty and the divestment, and also Emily, if you can pick up that question about the London Developers Group that you mentioned. Uh, um, so starting on the fiduciary duty point, I agree with Pierre that people are using it as an excuse. The United Nations for Principal Responsibles for Investment has said that fiduciary duty does actually include environmental and social, and there's a lot of investors who are signed up to the UNPRI. Um, the FCA have recently said fiduciary duty must include climate change, recognition to climate change, as well as environmental and social. And for years, we've had legislation saying that company directors must um, take responsibility respect to environmental and social it's very woolly but that fiduciary duty point I think is outdated and we almost need to get clearer guidance written to be able to circulate because there's so much evidence now that shows that environmental and social aspects are part of fiduciary duty 
Um, on the question about what do you do when you've got kind of short term investors and how do you be able, how can you start really? Anyone who knows me hates, I hate incremental change. I'm a big push for, for radical, massive, big scale. But where you've got really tricky things happening, actually nudging is not necessarily a bad way to start. Um, you know, we had one fund where um, we have an investor who may not be as aligned because it's from sort of historic reasons. And we're sort of nudging them along by showing if we do this, look, look, we get a great example is having a BRIAM certificate for a building, being able to show that if we get this building certificate that shows the building is sustainable, we can let it um, for higher rent, which then means that we can then get our tenants that want to do what we want to do. And then you can use that as an excuse to then, well, can we spend a bit more money because those tenants then want to be having a you know, higher sustainability criteria or green roof on their building. So nudging is not necessarily a terrible thing as long as it is combined with some big radical changes as well. Um, and then the other point around the development forum, at the moment, it's called the National Park City Development Forum. It's, uh, it's relatively small because we're still really in the pilot phases of working out how to best resource and also how best to um, get developers on, on board. But we've got uh, large developers such as Great Portland Estates, um, Quintain, um, the Lend Lease and lots of the, the, sort of the big scale as well as some more sort of newer developers coming to the fore who are very innovative. Um, like fabrics to sort of shake things up a bit. Actually, can I just stay with you, Emily, for a second? And um, so I remember when you were talking about coalition partners, you talked about them being first hesitant and now excited, and then kind of the whole thing becoming successful. How did you do that? How did we? How are we shifting that mindset into getting them excited? And when you answer, I also want to see how Ehab has done it in his conversations, because I'm sure he also has some really interesting lessons to impart to us all. I think part of it, it is almost overwhelmed to begin with. So within the built environment, we are constantly asked to sign up to membership groups for climate change, for sustainability, for specific things, and it's overwhelmed. And so in getting partners on board, what we want as National Park City, which is place-based solutions, it's showing that what they are doing, they're actually already doing, and we want to help showcase that. Um, the other part was just explaining that it's a forum that it is founded on trust, really, being able to share between each other challenges as well as opportunities and not, ne not necessarily taking some of the more challenging areas outside of that forum at that stage unless our members are comfortable. So that element of trust and then it's almost selling the business case benefits of why is being part of this forum good for them. Um, and how does it help their, their business, which for um, National Park City, it's that we're, we've got a pretty, a pretty strong brand in London for what we're doing, that we're supported by the Mayor of London, that we've got lots of access to community networks through our rangers, and all of that can then help benefit these developers when they need access to communities that sometimes it can be really hard to work out who to speak to. Whereas if you're already speaking with lots of different friends groups of parks and things, they're often very well connected in their local communities. And so using almost our networks to help them is, is the next phase of what we want to sort of test with this forum. Thanks, Emily. Ehab? Yeah, I think um, it's really about speaking the same language and understanding what it is um, that, you know, that audience is, is after. And if it, when it comes to investors, for example, when looking at the returns over a long term investment, say a 10 year investment, uh, an incremental um, amounts over time. Um, and then you look at the time that it would take to just do a conventional deal. Um, of say three to five years, um, you come away with uh, actually a lot more income from that investment within that three to five years, as opposed to the longer, um, uh, when you take the longer term uh, approach. Um, and so at the end of the day, if you're able to demonstrate in a very measured and clear uh, way what the actual value of taking this new approach is or adopting this new solution is, 
in a way that makes sense to the audience that you're speaking to, um, then that really makes all the difference. And it's also approaching it from a place of uh, empathy, because I think often it seems like you're on the, the other end of the spectrum um, when you're working with the finance sector and you're not from, uh, you're not within it, especially for a startup and an and and SME. Um, so I think just understanding each other and knowing how to speak language and debunking some of the myths about financing as well uh, really helps uh, bring things to a good level where, uh, you know, good negotiations could happen. We've all now have raised in one way or the other the importance of language, the importance of speaking the same language. And if I think back to the days of 2000. 16, when we were um, a knowledge partner to the G20 Green Finance Study Group, that's when we were trying to translate a lot of the kind of climate thinking into the financial language. So any thoughts of how do we address that problem? How do we bring the nature into mainstream financial and economic language? And how do we raise awareness across the spectrum that this is a mainstream risk and opportunity to be addressed. And I guess this is to, to the whole panel, anybody who would like to jump in, maybe starting with Ursula, because um, we've just been talking to Ihab and Emily. Ursula, you're muted. Yeah, I'm muted today. Um, I think language is extremely important. I'm really grateful that Ihab brought this up because, um, you know, I think we are, you know, the community of the converted, you know, we, we, we believe, it, you know, in the deeply in the intrinsic value and benefits um, of nature and your green infrastructure um, and, uh, and biodiversity. So I think this is, this is, this is, this is the problem that when we approach um, the other side, yeah, the, the financiers, the investors, that we try to convince with our language and it may not necessarily resonate very well because uh, it's a language that they don't necessarily understand because they don't really understand the subject. But I think if you actually then look at the other side of the coin and you try and work out the language that they understand is usually around risk um, and risk management and future proofing. And, uh, um, you know, this is also a language that insurers understand perfectly well. Um, and if you frame your arguments in that language, you're still getting the same thing across. Um, and I think there are manifold examples where you can frame it in a risk-based language, even though that may for us sound very negative. But if you're basically saying, well, if you don't do this, this will carry that risk. And I think, you know, this also, I think, fits in quite nicely in what you were saying, Nina, about, you know, data sets being available. You know, there are data sets around flooding risk. And if you are actually, if you are destroying, you know, all the, uh, the vegetation next to a small river, you concrete everything over, um, it's, not, it's not rocket science to work out what will happen. So I think, and also having sort of, you know, bite-side examples ready, that underline that risk and then coming with solutions that will turn that risk into an opportunity and also into future proofing. I think that is an approach that we need to take. Thanks, Ursula. And I guess I, I keep thinking about the IDB's work on Amazon tipping points and that example. So there's this uh, wonderful piece of research that effectively says that if we allow Amazon to tip into Savannah, the economic value, the economic GDP value to um, that region is in the region of $250 billion. But if we actually start implementing policies right now to stop that from happening, Happening, the benefit is in the region of $340 billion. So there is that um, economic argument to be made. And I think, I'm thinking back to what Pierre was saying about his example of creating a marine protected environment and the fishermen around it benefiting from it. That's another way to, to start framing that conversation. Pierre, do you have any thoughts about how do we align that language and kind of raise that awareness? Yes, because we have experienced that, uh, and um, I will say that the first, the first thing is that everybody needs to make the effort to go to the other side of the fence, so, uh, and not to remain in the comfort zone. So as financing people, we need to, we need to go and understand what the non-profit and vice versa, and what the, 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 the MDBs and the DFI. So 
we have to reconnect people who were not necessarily usually collected in the past. And so that's the first one. After we can have common point, uh, Ursula mentioned risk. <laughs> I completely agree on that. And I will add to that because risk we understand and, uh, and, uh, and we can align that to the same kind of understanding. Even sometimes in finance, we are using complicated name, but it's just the name which are complicated. At the end, when you realize what it means, it's quite simple. Uh, the second thing is impact. And for me, impact is uh, measuring an impact will become a common language that you can have. When we start uh, a project uh, and we are all around the table, we are starting to define what kind of impact we will have. How many people we take out of poverty? How many, how many trees are we saving? How many, uh, how many uh, and then impact. We have the, the SDG has been created. We can link to that. They exist, they are there. So uh, today uh, I'm very surprised that the, the finance didn't take the lead on measuring impact because it will be the way to lead. Today, there is no big institution doing it. Uh, it remains something a little bit vague and a little bit uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at each of us to, to define what we measure impact. But impact can be the, 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 the common denominator of uh, putting everybody on the same direction because everybody will agree on the impact that you realize. And after that, to monetize an impact is quite easy to do. <laughs> um, and so I do believe that in finance, we have to add you know, an additional, an additional common, the denominator about risk, about return and impact. And we have to work with the three, uh, that's the way to go. And when we, more we will measure the impact, more we will be able to fine tune it, more we will have a common language between the different people. And impact, we can use it very simply for uh, everybody in the street to understand what we're talking about. So I do believe that will resonate to people. Thanks, Pierre. And I'm just wondering, I, I saw Ehab thinking that, you know, wanting to come in on that point. Yeah, no, I can agree more uh, with, with what both Ursula and Pierre have said. Um, and I think me measuring risk and measuring impact are very similar and very interlinked in a way because um, it's kind of measuring positive and negative risk. You can think of impact as um, the positive, depending on what the scale looks like. But I think when you take that approach and you take it to a very practical level on an accounting basis um, and say you're looking at your accounting codes and you just insert a new code for carbon, insert a new code for biodiversity loss, insert a new code for education in the local community. And then as you are going through your transactions with every transaction, with every say product you sell, um, you then put in the carbon value, the, uh, the you know, contributions had to the social impact and all these other things. And life cycle assessment software that have existed for decades are doing this really, really well. They measure all of these different impacts and risks, and they put it into this new uh, unit that they've invented. And there's a number and there's basically a rating. And if something like this, bringing it back to a comment you made earlier, Ursula, about um, how you can standardize the assessment of opportunities and solutions for investors. Um, if you use something like this, like the life cycle assessment measurement or um, some kind of metric that demonstrates the impact and risk, um, then you immediately are able to link the financial benefit and the financial investment with the economic, social and environmental um, so, yeah, I just can't agree more that we need to think more impact and associated risk um, moving forward. And that then changes the mindset, which then enables the changes in the systems to happen um, further down the line. And if we stay with this, sorry, and if we stay with this kind of impact conversation. So at CISL, we've done some really interesting work with investment managers and asset owners on how do we measure impact of investment funds? And we have this kind of sustainable investment framework that looks at impact against the SDGs and it summarizes 17 SDGs into six impact themes. So I was going to go to Emily and ask her how much of that impact measurement at the investment fund level she's seeing within the industry, how spread out it is, and how easy, difficult is it to move towards all of the mainstream investment funds actually showing impact on their fact, uh, fund fact sheets? 
So we're using the sustainable development goals as a framework at the moment in order to help report on what we're doing, but that's very much at a corporate level. At a fund level, it again is dependent on investors and sort of working with them to, to get on, to, on side because it's quite time consuming at the moment and working out which of the sustainable development goals are most material to the, the fund's outcomes, really. The one thing that, well, what you're seeing with impact is that the environmental is very much leading. People are able to quantify the waste, the water, to some extent, green space, and definitely carbon and climate change. The one bit that is missing when it comes to nature though is if you're quantifying is making sure you're looking at quality as well as quantity. And that's something that a lot of impact metrics are not really picking up. So the new taxonomy um, for, for do no harm for the built environment just wants you to measure the amount of green space you've got in your building and site footprint compared to the amount that you don't. Now that's not saying, okay, was that actually good useful green space as compared to not having it at all if you just plaster your building in green walls and a green roof but the functions for them are not thought through i think we're going to struggle um so it's environmental the social side is just it might be different for other sectors but the built environment is constantly struggling with social because if you quantify things too much and you put too much of a financial value a lot of the actual impacts are often at a much more granular level um, and that wanting to go into an, sort of one example is we've got a shopping centre in, in Poland that we've done um, a quiet hours study on, which means that it's now suitable for people who have autism to be able to go there and spend time. But if we start putting numbers on all of that, it, it takes away from actually the experiences. So I think we have to be quite careful in what we're looking at when we're doing that impact measurement and measuring where we need to, but not trying to put an impact measurement against everything um, is my view. That's, that's fascinating. And actually, and I, I'm going to try to link it to what a lot of the comments that have come before. We've spoken a lot about how nature is conducive to climate. And actually, I think, Emily, what you've just pointed out there, and which is quite important, is when we're thinking about addressing climate change and addressing biodiversity loss, we need to think of it in a way that one helps each other. Because it, it's actually quite easy to um, let's say, plant trees to address climate while not looking at the kinds of trees you're planting, where you're planting them, and actually whether you are helping biodiversity or harming biodiversity with that space. So I think this is the inherent complexity of the nature discussion in comparison to the climate discussion. And I think I was going to pick up on something else. It's actually also a really nice link. Again, we've been speaking mostly about nature, but social that, you know, people come into this conversation. And our next week's webinar is going to be talking about exactly that, talking about the social element. Now, I am um, aware that we're starting to approach the tail end of our conversation. So if I can pose a question to all of our panelists. So this is you know, us going into kind of a call to action. So as far as all of you are concerned, what is the big unlock? So what have you not yet been able to achieve that you'd like to? And what would you like to ask the audience to focus on to enable a greater scale and pace of change to take place? And if on this one, I start with Ursula. Yeah, I have to, I hate to come back to the data, but <laughs> this is something, I'm sounding like a little bit of a broken record, but I have been actually like preaching this now for years and years and years, and it doesn't really matter which sustainability aspect you're looking at, um, is that our sector is, um, is quite good at modeling, yeah? But in terms of the nitty gritty of actually uh, collecting data for whatever purposes is, is not is not very good. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there cannot be an excuse anymore. I mean, we're living in a, you know, in an age of big data, <laughs> you know, but in some ways, you know, the sector is still in the Jurassic age. Um, and that makes approaching all of these all of these issues, and you mentioned social as well, so much 
more difficult. And it gives those laggards who don't feel that they need to act almost a carte blanche because they say, well, I just can't do it because I just, we haven't got any data. Um, and that's not true because the data is there. It's just not. It's just not consistently captured, not consistently stored, and not consistently managed. Um, because you know it's all over the place. And I, I think that this this sector has such an opportunity to really uh, make a very significant concrete contribution to tackling climate change and halting biodiversity loss. Um, I'm meeting the Paris targets, but the way we're going about this is still a little bit haphazard, I'm afraid. Yeah. So call from Ursula to all of you who are starting projects that have anything to do with data to make sure that they're consistent and then they will continue providing data after you, you're done with it. Yeah. Pierre? <laughs> yeah, uh, as a... I think uh, I support the data issue, of course, is one of the elements that we have to uh, to put into. But if I have to select the the choice, is for me a, a common platform today uh, where where we can operate uh, when we can develop and operate nature based solution. Today, today uh, the the transaction cost is too high. Uh, if we have to pile up everything. And if we have to put together the philanthropy, the, uh, the, uh, the, the public sector and the private sector, uh, including the investors, the, the banks, et cetera, we need to, we need to create, uh, we need to create uh, not necessarily a global one because that is realistic, but at least by, by maybe a European one, maybe a UK one, maybe a, we need to create several platforms where we, we reduce the cost of transaction where we do simplify the legal, just to give you an idea, on each transaction, I have more than 2,000 pages of legal documents. How many transactions we can do like that if, uh, if we have to uh, pile up uh, so many documents? Uh, there is no one investor who will look at it. <laughs> so um, we need to simplify. We need to, uh, we need to recreate a, a, a legal and a political structure which is adapted to what we want to achieve. And in that regards, for me, ESG, ESG is, uh, is just the starting point uh, and, not the, and not the final point, uh, like many operators believe. And we need to develop impact measurement on, the, on, on those type of platform. Yeah. So call for simplification and templates and more collaboration. Yeah, bringing together the different source of funds. We have seen that blended finance is key. We have seen that impact measurement is key, and for that we need data. So uh, without data, we cannot do it. Uh, and we need transparency. Uh, we need to think forward, and we need uh, we need and not backwards, not based on the past, but based on the future. Uh, technology is accelerating; it has to be science based. So you need to create the platform who allow that. If you don't create the platform, look in Europe. We have a Copernicus, but finance cannot use Copernicus. So why <laughs> we we have we have, how do we build a platform when we can have access to all the information that we need and we can operate at the best cost? Thank you so much, Pierre. Emily, change our appraisal methodology. If you're appraising based on financial outcomes, we'll get financial outcomes. So yeah, my biggest call is, can we please build in environmental and social? Just an example of that is what we're, we're testing through our investment process at the moment is that we have two stages. We have an IAC, which is an investment committee stage one and an investment committee stage two. And actually doing things like a climate change assessment an initial carbon assessment. And as we can start to get a better understanding of the green space at the earliest stage, and then when you go into the more detailed, like the flood risk modeling, that can be done later on, but to try and work out how you're gonna get your appraisal to match up with the investment process and to change it so that it actually takes into account these um, issues we've been discussing today. At the project level or at the personal senior executive? Both, oh. um, but at the project level. So at the top level, you need a balanced scorecard, but at the project level and at the building level, we're buying and selling and developing buildings. It needs to be part of the appraisal model. And until it isn't, 
it will we'll keep having the same conversations. And perfect. And actually, it was quite interesting today, uh, the AFT discussed Mars's new appraisal model that equates financial performance with uh, carbon targets in for their senior executives. So we need that in addition to the project one, EHAB. Um, I think just to echo some of what was just mentioned, uh, only very recently have we managed to um, develop intelligence and advanced tech that could begin to truly understand and mimic the genius of the natural world. Um, and so we need a complete mindset uh, change. And I think when you speak to so many sectors and you see that the challenges are so interwoven, interlinked and nuanced, uh, very much like Emily mentioned about the social impact uh, area, which is a whole minefield and really kind of challenging to, to pin down. Um, we can now, you know, not look at these problems or challenges in isolation, um, but stretch the boundaries of how we perceive these different uh, challenges and issues um, really reveal the relationships and the links in between them and embed that in the way that we make decisions and in the way that we take uh, action in valuing natural capital. Um, so, you know, valuing environmental impact as well as social and economic impact is a really key uh, thing that I would like to, um, you know, highlight if we're looking at the aim being regeneration to address the climate crisis. We can make use of the intelligence we see in nature and begin objectively valuing commodities and resources on the basis of their immediate and wider impact. And therefore it results in a much more enlightened value system. That's absolutely brilliant. We had four quite diverse unlocks that seem to be actually building on each other. So if you allow me, I will try to summarize quite a, a wide ranging discussion over the last hour and a half. I think we've spoken about the valuing nature. We started with um, how do we value nature? Should we value nature? And how do we move nature away from currently being valued at zero to um, thinking through the policies, um, uh, practices and standards that could be on the one hand merging in the European Union space, on the other hand, the way some of the standards are being built could be inhibiting kind of this emerging um, innovator ecosystem from coming in. And I really like the kind disruption <laughs> that EHAB is engaging in and kindly disrupting the existing corporate ecosystem. We've spoken about data and how on the one hand, there is never enough data, but on the other hand, that should not block our progress, that we should start with data sets that are currently available, that allow us to understand some of the risks that both corporates and financiers are running on their, within their portfolios and start thinking about ways in which we can measure and mitigate those risks which will help the whole financial system start adapting to the new reality. We spoke about the importance of impact in this conversation and how we shouldn't just look at the risks to our corporate world, but the impact our corporate world has on the natural ecosystem and how that impact can be measured, how it could be incorporated into our mainstream, again, economic and financing decisions. We have spoken about how sometimes what we measure maybe conceals things. We've spoken about the fact that we need to think about climate and nature together in um, their totality, where they actually help each other, as opposed to addressing one goal while creating unintended consequences for a much bigger crisis on the other side. As well as uh, we've spoken about ways in which we could think about rewiring the whole economic and financial system. So I think we had a supremely wide ranging discussion and um, we've had some really interesting and really brilliant questions. And I thank you for sending us those. I also want to make sure that we don't forget that this year, 2021, is the year of two COPs, not one, but two COPs, the super important climate COP in which we're able to restate 
our targets, our targets that we have committed to under the Paris Agreement, and we should be aiming for a much better attempt at getting to one and a half degrees. But in addition to that, we have a COP15, which is kicking off this year, which is the biodiversity COP in Kunming, because not only do we need to bring in plans to address the climate emergency, but we also need to start setting targets on how we can stop reverse and reverse biodiversity loss and work not only to a net zero, but a nature positive economy. So I think those two should stay in our heads. So thank you very much to our absolutely brilliant panelists. What remains for me to say is to um, remind everybody that we have um, recorded the webinar and we will send it out and please feel free to share it. And that this is part of a series of a three part series. And the third one on unlocking social values is going to take place on Wednesday, the 13th of October. And if you would like to find out more about the wonderful uh, work that both CISL and the Future Spaces Foundation are doing, do please connect with us um, on our Building Change Hub and, uh, and under the hashtag of Natural Connections. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much to our audience for being a very active one. And thank you very much um, for, um, to Ken and to the Future Spaces Foundation for bringing this series together.